Thanks, Kate. So um, let me just bring up the first slide. So basically, these um, the, the purpose of the talk today is to go over, and please let me know about volume, because I have a loud voice. Um, the, go over some of the provisions under in, that are in effect in Medicare, irrespective of the Affordable Care Act or anything else. These are all provisions that um, are universally agreed upon as being good for older adults. And so it's a pretty dry topic, but we'll go over these um, in a way that will allow you to at least be familiar with what I consider um, very much an alphabet soup. So, um, so the purposes are to talk about some of the, these new provisions, some related to preventative care under the Affordable Care Act, but again, are going to be in place, we think, indefinitely. Some are really, uh, ch touch upon briefly how uh, the impact uh, these have had on de dementia and depression evaluations, just because those are so common in our population. Talk a little bit briefly about uh, transitional care management and chronic care management. And last but not least, just talk about the, uh, briefly to uh, go over the provision for advanced care planning. So to talk about preventative care, I think it's just uh, good for us to look at how different and how heterogeneous our patients are as they get older. The two cases illustrated, I don't have to read um, every line of the case. One is an 86-year-old woman, because you can all see this, who has um, basically minimal medical problems, a little bit of hypertension and incontinence, 86 years old and really is quite healthy and so there's a panel of preventative care that you might consider for this patient that contrasts greatly with case number two who's actually a year younger but has CKD with albuminuria very thin has peripheral vascular disease and the uh, attendant abnormal labs so very different type of approach to preventative care so with that in mind, um, since 2011, Medicare has provided for an initial welcome to Medicare preventative care visit and then a yearly annual wellness visit, which are freebies, totally free, no deductible, no copay for these visits. So many of you are probably familiar with these already because they've been in place for five to six years. But what I would like to highlight is that this is a good thing for many older patients. It reviews medical history, screens for depression and cognitive impairment, and really looks at everything from seatbelt use to, you know, do you have a smoke alarm? And more recently also says, do you have an advanced care plan in place? So you not only have a first annual one, but then every year you're entitled to this kind of a visit. And what's interesting about these visits is that the patient has to really believe that they're valuable because it is quite a long checklist of everything from health risk assessment to who are your providers for everything from your oxygen to your um, front wheels rocker, et cetera. And all of these have to be just touched upon and then a plan of care addressed. So again, um, this is every 12 months for a patient. And if you look, it's quite, it's reasonably well uh, reimbursed with geographic adjustment. And I have, for each of these provisions, I have uh, just an average reimbursement that is primarily to the provider. Uh, and some places you'll see an F, and that's the facility fee if it's in the hospital. But otherwise, the NF refers to what the provider's office is reimbursed from that for Medicare. So a typical annual wellness visit now, again, many of you are familiar with this, is really electronically mediated. That is, the, the medical assistant checks in the patient. Ideally, they would have filled out the paperwork even before they come in. The, they do their, the MA does their checklist, and then the provider comes in, does a brief written plan, and then thinks about what additional tests or evaluations might be needed based on that initial that, uh, wellness visit. So the main drive, the main take home point I want to have about this visit though is that you have to set patient expectations. This is a visit that's truly geared to look for problems that aren't already on the table for that patient. If the patient says, well, I'd like to talk about my back pain, my, um, my other concerns, you know, knee pain or whatever, you either have to have a modifier and have time to do the additional evaluation or bring them in for a second visit. And so patients really have to be aware that these annual wellness visits are truly to look for preventative care type issues. And um, with the, that though, we have to appreciate as geriatricians that these preventative issues are often ones that don't necessarily come on the table unless you ask. The big ones for us being things like cognitive impairment, decrease in functional status, safety issues within the home, and of course, uh, screening for mood disorders, especially depression. So, um, 
touching back on those two cases I told you then, you're going to have to keep in mind that your patients are going to want different things that are largely based on their personal physiology and not necessarily their birth date. So that's just a, a basic principle of any type of preventative care that we do in the older population. And I know you already talked about life expectancy calculators, so I won't go through that, but that is one tool we sometimes use to help patients make decisions on how much they're going to go into these type of preventative care uh, appointments. Uh, touching back briefly on t two of the key highlights of this type of preventative care that we all care about, one is the depression screening is not only in place, but there's also greater provisions under the Affordable Care Act to do something about screening for depression if a patient screens positive. One thing to note, though, is that there hasn't been a whole lot of uptake on depression treatment and screening and depression with this provision, and they think it's largely because other guidelines have come into play even before um, the annual, uh, before the Affordable Care Act that probably led to increased screening. The other thing that has, um, we should touch upon as geriatricians is the whole um, uh, heightened awareness of cognitive impairment screening. Any concern by any person can bring this into play now, and it allows for a plan that not includes, not only includes neuropsych testing, but also includes imaging. And just wanted to note that imaging now includes MRI, which is now widely covered. Getting on to um, the next level, um, something you might not be as aware of is the whole concept now of uh, transitional care management, a newly covered benefit. Uh, case here represents someone who's in and out of the emergency room and now more recently has been placed in a SNF and is now coming home and has poor resources. What this new provision, transitional care management, does, it allows you from day zero of when they leave the skilled nursing facility or the hospital to really start a 30-day plan of care that allows for ideally keeping the patient from going right back into the hospital. And so one of the things that you um, should know about this is it's a 30-day period. Uh, that goes from day zero of when they leave. You do have to make a provision to see the patient, and that's the tricky thing. Uh, there's a higher, actually, amount of reimbursement if you can see that patient within seven days. So it's, it's making contact, establishing contact, and making sure you see that patient who's at high risk because they've had a recent transition of care. So it's a good benefit. The next thing, I will, uh, the next area that might be a little bit more new to you is something called chronic care management, something we've all done for years and have never gotten reimbursed from. The case here is a person who's always on the phone calling the clinic, needs a lot of help with just phone management, things that can be managed by the phone, can't necessarily come into clinic or even needs to come into clinic, and is basically taking up consistent clinic time asking for help with transportation, med refills, and getting to other appointments that aren't necessarily their primary care appointment. This provision is now provided for under chronic care management. This started two years ago now, has been uh, easier to incorporate than transitional care management, has a monthly allotment that you can see right there per patient per month. And what's been great about chronic care management is they now have a complex chronic care management that is the most difficult patients, i.e. those that take 60 minutes a month of your staff time, that if you can um, provide for oversight of those patients, you can get up to $93 a month per patient per month for chronic care management. These are patients who are at the highest risk of morbidity and mortality. They have two or more chronic conditions, which is pretty much all of our patients, and who need that constant support. They don't even need to come in to be um, eligible for chronic care management. What's been great is that they've even waived the consent process for this. It used to be that the patient had to come in and sign all this paperwork to be enrolled in chronic care management, but more recently they've decided that you can do phone consent, and they only, the patient only needs to come in if they haven't been seen in 12 months. So that consent really just tells the patient what are they going to get, what are the expectations, and the fact that they can leave the chronic care management plan anytime they want to. So a great provision and has just recently been put into place by many practices. And then last but not least, we want to talk about advanced care planning. This is the newest one, although um, complex chronic care management is actually the newest provision. But this is the next to the newest one, which is advanced care planning. This is now reimbursed as a separate visit. It requires a face-to-face -face and a minimum of 30 minutes of time 
dedicated to the idea that the patient is voluntarily making plans for how they want their end of life care to go. It provides for the forms and the other associated things that you might want to have um, in place so that people know what your wishes truly are. This can actually be billed multiple times during the year as the patient's status changes, for example, if they have a new cancer diagnosis. And it even provides for additional time of 30 minutes for additional time if it's a very, very complex case that requires a long family meeting. So that's um, a sort of a whirlwind tour of um, the, many of these new provisions. These are all here to stay. I think that the annual wellness visit is probably the one that we find many patients don't really see the value of. The transitional care management code is very helpful, but um, is probably the hardest to institute because you've got to do that day zero up through day 30 documentation. The chronic care management code, we all agree, has been really great. They've pared down the level of paperwork needed to put it into place, and they now have this new complex CCM code for patients who take about 60 minutes a month of provider time, a uh, staffing time with provider oversight, of course. And then not, uh, last but not least, we're really, of course, excited about advanced care planning. I think for many geriatrician providers, uh, advanced care planning, because it requires a 30-minute um, uh, uh, meeting, might not necessarily